we hold hostage the government of the United States and put everyone through pain needlessly with significant adverse consequences that ripple through our economy. Second, let's, let's take a mature look at the issues on border security. Uh, border security is essential. Of course it is. It's critical. No one denies that. But border security is only one part of immigration reform. It, it starts uh, with a pathway towards citizenship. It's many dimensions. In 2005, the Senate passed an immigration reform bill. It was my, my bill. Uh, it was the Hagel-Martinez compromise. We got 65 votes, bipartisan votes. The House would never take it up, so it died. No conference. But border security, how do we defend our border? All the different variations uh, of, that, of that issue uh, need to be explored maturely. Let's all get together and do what's right for this country. That's what I would say to the leader. Okay, so I want to get into the debate on, on immigration reform in a moment. But first, to the actual physical act of border security, this is what the president said today uh, from, from the Oval Office. This is what he said about walls. We've got to get the politics out of this and go back to common sense. You know, they say it's a medieval solution, a wall. That's true. It's medieval because it worked then and it works even better now. Well, I mean, you know, he has a lot of supporters, the president. He has a base that, who believes in him. He has a solid 38, 39, 40 percent of the American people still behind him. And that's what he believes. What are the facts on the wall? Where do the illegal immigrants come from? Where do the drugs and the smugglers and, and things like that come from? Well, you look at that 2,000 mile southern border we have. Uh, a, a wall is not the answer or a large fence for all 2,000 uh, miles of it. I mean, there are states' rights issues, property rights issues, geography issues that uh, uh, get in the way of all of that. So partly uh, a fence, which we have down there, by the way, uh, uh, Bush supported it, Obama supported it. So we have miles and miles of fencing and of, of some walls. So that's part of it. But there are other dimensions to it. Illegal drugs, where do they come from? Uh, where, where do the problems come from uh, in coming across our border? Illegal drugs come more from commercial exchanges hidden in trucks that come across that border legally, by the way, and, and uh, through uh, the seas, uh, through monitoring on our coasts. We, we, can't, we only get about 25% uh, of the illegal drugs that come in, we think, uh, by boat. So uh, it isn't all the southern border. The northern border uh, has also some issues about who illegally comes in there. But the numbers that most recently uh, provided by the State Department uh, show the numbers aren't anywhere near what the president is talking about as to people coming into this country and illegal problems of drugs and so on. A lot of the problem that we have are the 11 or 12 million immigrants in this country uh, who do not have a status, who uh, never went back to their country after their visas were up. That's where most of the issue is with the 11 or 12 million. And actually, I heard something extraordinary today, that a lot of the so-called illegal immigration is from overstaying visas. And one congressman told a British uh, outlet today that most of those who overstay are Canadians coming from the north and not, uh, and not from, the, from others from the south. But let me ask you this. Look, many people believe that what President Trump is doing is all politics and all reacting to his base. But equally, others believe that this issue of immigration is a deeply held personal conviction of his and of the people who he surrounded himself with, that they would like to go back to the halcyon days of America, majority white, you know, the, 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 the halcyon days when there weren't so many foreign-born Americans uh, in the country. And that this is actually just a precursor to restricting not illegal immigration only, but legal migration. Do you believe that to be, you know, what's really behind this? Well, I think that's a part of, of what's behind this, because uh, there are a lot of people in this country who believe what you said. But the reality is the demographics in this country are moving in a direction by 2045, certainly by 2050. Uh, white Caucasians in this country will be the minority. Uh, that's just the reality. 
And uh, the immigrant population coming in from all over the world for 250 years of American history has enhanced America. It's made us all stronger. In fact, we've all come into America that way. We're here because of that. Uh, I don't think we should fight that. I think we should welcome that. Certainly it needs to be done legally. Certainly our borders need to be protected and secured. That's not an issue. The president distorts that uh, all the time. And uh, he gives figures that are just not true. And, and when you do that, then the substance uh, and the centerpiece of the issue gets lost because people veer off into the other directions that uh, they chase things that just aren't real and aren't true. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's look further afield. Uh, again, as former Defense Secretary, you had to deal with all sorts of issues, uh, including obviously Syria. What do you make of the sort of back and forth, sort of whiplashy Syria policy that's gone, gone around for the last uh, several days? First, the president, you know, it announces that troops will immediately come home. Then there's a huge backlash by partisan, and it's sort of graduated. Then it'll, it'll be within, you know, 120 days, and now it'll be conditions-based. Just where do you stand on this issue right now? Well, first of all, uh, I think the president really doesn't understand foreign policy, uh, how it's made, interests, consequences, allies, and I, I think the, the proof of that is certainly in uh, whatever his so-called Syrian policy is. Confusing at best, uh, certainly chaotic, dangerous, especially in a chaotic uh, part of the world. Uh, when you make a decision like he did initially, and you make that decision via Twitter, uh, you do not consult your National Security Council, your experts. You don't consult allies. Uh, the consequences of that, of that decision are astounding, as he has found out the last uh, two weeks. Um, timing of it uh, was terrible. Uh, we've got to find ways to find diplomatic solutions, uh, work toward strategic objectives. Uh, using your military isn't going to isn't going to fix that. We found that out after 18 years in Afghanistan, 15 years uh, in Iraq. And unless you work toward that with allies, uh, with the uh, nations that are there, uh, it will be a failure. He doesn't understand any of that. So he's had to retreat. And that disastrous uh, meeting, meetings that the National Security Council advisor, Bolton, had in Turkey were embarrassing for America. Erdogan uh, scolded him. Erdogan wouldn't even talk to him. He... Uh, he was saying, Bolton was saying things that Turkey must do in order for us to leave. Uh, well, when America says, well, a country must do this before we leave somewhere, you got to be very careful. Uh, that certainly uh, smacks of arrogance and uh, other dimensions of a foreign policy that you, you do not want to have. So, so I think it's, it's just dangerous, confusing, and uh, they, they've got to understand They've got to find ways with allies to deal with these big issues. Uh, to be fair, it appears that John Bolton was trying to make sure, and correct me if I'm wrong, by reading the riot act to Turkey, that they didn't go in and slaughter the Turkish, or rather the Kurdish forces, who've been America's strongest allies in the fight against ISIS on the ground. But as you say, Erdogan doesn't like to be told anything by anyone, and this is what he said. We cannot accept the comments made by Bolton in Israel. Bolton has made a serious mistake, and whoever thinks like this has also make a mis made a mistake. We will not compromise. So that brings up a whole load of things that you touched on. This administration's policy and its re relationship with its allies. Um, what do you make of America's, the status of America's global leadership right now? Well, the status of American global leadership now uh, is really nowhere. We, we, we have retreated in especially the commentary the President of the United States has had over his first two years in office. This America first, he gives a speech at the United Nations, America first, you're all freeloaders, he says to NATO, to our allies. 
Uh, I'm going to revisit all uh, of our alliance relationships, our trade relationships. You've all taken advantage of us. It's a, it's a unilateralism uh, in a multilateral world that is very, very uh, dangerous. On Turkey, your points about Erdogan, I, uh, I last uh, talked when, with uh, Erdogan when I was Secretary of Defense in the fall of 2014. I've known him since 2002 when I first met him, when he, when he first Justice Development Party swept into power. And he said to me then, he has said this constantly, we believe the Kurds are, are our number one threat. Now, you can disbelieve that. You can tell him they're not your number one threat. It's ISIS, however way you want to do it. But that, that is Turkey's evaluation. So what you have to do is work with Turkey to find ways around that so that you can protect the Kurds right. and you can uh, accomplish the things you need to accomplish. All right. well, let, let me um, then, to, to be absolutely you know, spot on on this debate, the Obama administration did not acquit itself heroically over Syria. You were a defense secretary in that administration. And as you very well know, there was a point, let's say 2012 or whatever, where the, the facts on the ground could have been changed, and Russia and Iran would not have been the dominant power leading to Assad's almost total victory. Those are the facts. And your administration did not, uh, did not do what it could have done. So I want to ask you this at this point. A senior commander told me at the time, you know, why would it not have been in America's strategic interest in the, in the, at that time to, to take out these people who could have fought with them or for them, take them next door into Jordan, train them up, not for six days or six weeks, but six months, and send them back to do this work. Your administration didn't do it. Big mistake, right? And here we are all these years later. Yes, it was a mistake. Um, I think it was a, a big mistake. I think it was the biggest foreign policy mistake of the Obama administration. Um, uh, we met for many months on this and had a decision agreed to, which, which the president had uh, had ordered a strike, and then uh, pulled it down. Uh, I think when we did that, that signaled to Russia uh, and uh, other nations that, uh, first of all, the president of the United States' word is no good, and that's always dangerous. But uh, that signaled to the Russians, you can have Syria, uh, and, and it was dangerous. And matter of fact, uh, when I left the Pentagon in February 2015, uh, one of the differences uh, I had with the administration was over Syria. I had written a memo, which the New York Times got a hold of, a uh, memo to Kerry and, and uh, Susan Rice and others in the administration saying, uh, we don't have a clear Syrian policy. I was being hammered on it by our NATO allies, by our Middle East allies. Uh, what is your policy? What are you going to do? What are you trying to do? We, we just didn't have one. So uh, you're right. It, 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 I think it was a fundamental mistake. And, and I guess the, the question, therefore, is you just say, you know, they, Russia could have it. Well, now President Trump has said, well, Iran can have Syria. We don't want it. We don't need it. And the bottom line is, and I'll read you these stats, that, you know, 48% of Americans support withdrawing from Syria. 33% oppose it. 56% of Americans support bringing home half troops from Afghanistan. Only 26% oppose. So in that regard, the president has the people behind him. Well, that's right. And it, it's a pretty basic equation here, uh, Christiana. Uh, Americans do not, will not support long wars, long, drawn-out wars, especially in a place like the Middle East that uh, I don't think has ever been as unstable and volatile and combustible as it is now. So uh, Afghanistan is close by, 18 years in Afghanistan. Afghanistan's worse off today than it's, than it's ever been. Uh, the mistake that Trump has made, in my opinion, is right when we're trying to work on a diplomatic solution, when we have a diplomatic representatives uh, meeting with the Taliban uh, and others to try to find a diplomatic solution, then he talks about withdrawing troops, pulling troops out. Uh, that's not the time to talk about troop withdrawal. So uh, I think uh, Americans are just fed up with it all. I think that's reflected in the Congress, a lot of Democrats and Republicans 
uh, feel the same way. But I think Trump makes it worse by the timing and, and not giving the diplomatic effort and putting that in investment to try to find that solution. It'll be an imperfect solution. I don't think we want to balkanize Syria. I don't think we want to balkanize uh, Middle East where the, the boundaries just don't matter and you have a little of this, a little of this, a little of this. That's, that's what's dangerous. You'll, you'll never get rid of ISIS, for example, or Al-Qaeda or a half a dozen other terrorist groups with, with that kind of a world. And it's important to note that ISIS is not fully defeated. It's definitely on the back foot, but the Pentagon even just said that it is not defeated and it could come back. Well, Secretary Hagel, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Well, it's always a pleasure. Thank you very much.